Welcome, welcome, folks. It is Wednesday, August the 13th. This is Hurricane Hub Live, streaming on 13 News Now Plus. I am Chief Meteorologist Tim Pandagis, and I'm so glad to have you with us tonight. Special shout out to our YouTube viewers. Your questions below are so great. Love hearing from you and suggestions for the show. Type them on in the bottom if you can. Uh, but tonight on HHL, we've got a slam-packed show. Lots to talk about in the Atlantic Basin. Of course, Aaron is the headline. It's a bit stronger this evening. Still a tropical storm, but it's not 45-mile-per-hour winds like we've seen the last two days straight. Now, recon aircraft, we're talking hurricane hunters, being forward deployed out to the Caribbean, the U.S. Virgin Islands. They go to their base out there in St. Croix. That way they can base missions out of there into uh, Aaron as it approaches the Lesser Antilles over the next uh, couple of days. Now, uncertainty remains high with yet again more run-to-run -run variations today. It's kind of been like a windshield wiper. On Monday, the trend was farther to the west, closer to the east coast. Yesterday, the trend was a little farther to the east closer to Bermuda and even east of Bermuda. Guess what today's trend is? Well, back to the west a little bit. I'm going to show you the brand new trends, brand new model runs, indicating that it, it may be a little bit more of a threat to the U.S. East Coast, and it can't be written off just yet. We're still too far out. And then surprise, 98L just been tagged in the Caribbean. In fact, it's over the Yucatan Peninsula right now, headed into the southern Gulf Bay of Campeche. Low odds of it developing, but boy, on satellite imagery, it does look quite impressive, and we'll Touch on that as well. Let's start with Tropical Storm Aaron. As I mentioned with the 5 o'clock advisory, a little bit stronger. 50 mile per hour winds. Pressures come down a little bit. Wind speeds have come up slightly. Also, it's forward speed. Yesterday, I believe when we talked, it was about 22 miles per hour was moving to the west. It slowed down to around 17. Ideal transitional speed for storms is between 10 to 15 miles per hour. I guess that's the average uh, speed for tropical systems in the main development region. So we're a little bit above that, but it has come down in forward speed. And that forward movement is actually going to be quite critical when we get farther out in the forecast period. If it continues to slow down, or speed up, it may not line up with steering mechanisms that may alter its forecast track by early to middle parts of next week. And we'll talk about that as well. But here's how it looks on infrared satellite imagery. Remember, we use this because we get the cloud top temperatures. It's an infrared imagery taking the temperature of the cloud tops. Colder cloud tops, stronger thunderstorms. Colder cloud tops are indicated by the shades of white. And even in the class uh, couple of, of uh, shades there, a couple of frames there showing us some shades of pink and purple. So obviously here, 12-hour run, Aaron is starting to sense a more favorable environment. Warmer sea surface temperatures, uh, overall just more beneficial to intensification of a tropical system. And it's evident here, at least on infrared satellite imagery, switching things up to how it looks on visible still has its structure there. It's been a healthy structure pretty much from the get-go. But you can notice something here. We've got a little bit of some easterly shear that's uh, lopping off some of its far eastern side of the storm. That's kind of displacing some of the convection on the western side there. Doesn't look to be disrupting it too much, and wind shear is expected to get even lower. It's not even particularly high at this point as it moves off towards the west. You can still sense some of that more stable air off to the north and west, and that's indicated also uh, by the water vapor showing the dry mid-levels of the atmosphere lurking pretty much due west. And it's been this way the entire time. Aaron's been doing a very efficient job of walling off that dry air from getting entrained into the system. If that were to happen, which it very well could, especially as it continues to intensify, it would kind of like sputter a little bit. Think of it as an engine running out of gas and sucking in some dry air. It would sputter a little bit, kind of throw it off from its intensification trend. That could certainly happen here as we get a stronger air and going forward. But as of right now, it's doing a good job of keeping that dry air at bay. Now, sea surface temperatures for its entire lifespan so far has been outside of this red hued shading here. What this means is any water temperatures that are above 80 degrees, which is suitable for tropical development. You get that late heat transfer between the surface of the ocean and the atmosphere there. You get that everywhere going forward to the west here on, on its forecast track. It hasn't had that, but it's still been able to maintain itself as a tropical storm, albeit a weak tropical storm, but still a tropical storm. So the structure, the bones are good. And as it builds into an environment that's just more and more suitable, Warmer waters, and not only warmer waters on the skin of the ocean, the ocean heat content, which is the warm water down to a depth, just gets more and more 
suitable to the west and northwest here. These shades of uh, aqua and green and yellow is warm water extending down to a great depth. And why that's important is because at this point in time, we're going to have a hurricane and possibly even major hurricane. When you get a stronger storm, it begins to mix up the ocean called upwelling. And that typically replaces the warm water at the surface with cooler waters from below. But when you've got warm water extending down 50, 100 meters, you can certainly just continue to upwell more and more warm water. So it's, it's almost like an endless supply of energy, even when you get a very strong storm. That's why, especially in the Caribbean, you see the ocean heat content here. Storms can just blow up in intensity. Same with the southwest Atlantic here. So we'll have to watch that closely uh, with not only warm ocean waters, but down to a depth. We've got the heat content there as well. All right, here's the 5 o'clock advisory uh, from the National Hurricane Center, the forecast track. And overall, now we, we were named uh, Aaron at 11 o'clock in the morning on Monday. Since then, there haven't been many big changes to the forecast track overall. Mainly a west, even southwest at times here, a little bend to the southwest, and then a northwesterly trajectory, and then a due north turn at the tail end. That's pretty much been the forecast for now 48 hours. Now, the only changes has been some tweaks in intensity. So now we expect to see a hurricane here, likely Thursday night up to a cat one by Friday morning, 2 a.m., so overnight Thursday into Friday. And then by, uh, let's say, late Saturday into early Sunday, we're up to a major Category 3 hurricane. Now max intensity within five days, because the cone only goes out five days, is up to 120 mile per hour winds. Could it exceed that? Certainly. Intensity forecasts are some of the hardest things to nail down. And when you've got a suitable environment, when you've got uh, sea surface temperatures that are very warm and it extends down to a depth, I wouldn't doubt we see this be a little more intense uh, than what we're seeing depicted here. And certainly as it takes its turn to the north, it could maintain a major hurricane uh, intensity, maybe even get stronger as it moves to the north as well. But that is the current forecast track from the National Hurricane Center. What do things look like after we get outside of the cone? past five days where well, we take over the, the long-range computer models, right? Each line you're seeing here is an ensemble member of either the GFS, the Canadian, or the European. So there are dozens and dozens of lines here, which is a computer model that's run with just a slightly different variable or modification that tweaks the outcome. So a small change in the beginning has an exponential difference in the end, okay? And there is still quite a spread. The uncertainty level is very high still. So we go from the Bahamas to hundreds of miles east of Bermuda. We're talking about a, like a, an 1,100-mile span. Now, what you'll notice here as well is that compared to yesterday, there are a few members, in fact, a lot of members, that have jogged a little bit farther to the west, and even a few that show a landfall in the U.S. These are outliers at this moment in time. Is this the start of a trend? It could be, or it could just be an outlier for a run, and then it goes back towards the east like a lot of other models have been. We'll have to watch it, which is why there's still a lot of time for things to change here. Now, I want to show you something that when you look at this, it may be a little worrisome or ominous. But what I'm going to preface it with is that this is one computer model run, and things will certainly change, whether it be for the worse or for the better in the next seven days or so. So model comparison here between the GFS, the American, and the European. GFS is going to be in yellow. European is going to be in red. We'll start things off here on Friday. We've got hurricane development here, just to the northeast of the Lesser Antilles. Really start to see it intensify by the later part of the weekend. We're now north of the Dominican Republic in Haiti, just outside of Turks and Caicos. Major hurricane status by that point in time. European and GFS not too far apart. European is 50 miles or so off to the west. Uh, GFS, a little bit farther off to the east. Watch what happens. Off to the north, and then to a northwest turn, according to the European. I'm going to stop it here. So the European now favors a westerly track close to the coast on this run. Now, I would say the European has been an outlier, but coming on board has been the newest run of the GFS, which also takes a hike farther to the west, not as far west as what we're seeing with the European. Here's Bermuda. If you remember yesterday, GFS was like way out that way to the east. Today, it's now on the western side of Bermuda, which if that does occur with the GFS, that would put Bermuda on the dirty side of the storm, 
the eastern side from that storm center is going to be the strongest of the winds, highest storm surge, that sort of deal. Not a good place to be. Uh, but European right now off to the west. So we'll see if that changes or if that's the beginning of a trend indicating a higher threat uh, to the U.S. All right, I want to show you now the differences, see if it works today. It was working when I uh, ran through it earlier. But the differences between the, the ensemble runs of both the European and the G, uh, not, excuse me, just the European model, the, Z, the zero Z runs and the 12 Z runs. Looks like it's not going to cooperate with me this time around either. I will tell you there is a shift in the 12 Z farther to the west, which you saw on the European showing the big, big red blob there of the storm sitting off the eastern seaboard. Regardless of what track it takes, if it's going to be a U.S. threat, we're still about nine days out. So, again, folks, it's, it's nothing imminent. This is going to be something that will evolve here. But right now, we're right about nine days or so if it continues to move at its current speed. Or probably even a little bit faster than that because that's going between the speed of 10 to 15. Now it's at 17. If it slows down, maybe it does. But uh, looking at a nine-day time frame here. I did mention the Hurricane Hunters getting forward deployed. And here's a look at that. They're, they're, high, they're flying out a uh, Hurricane Hunter aircraft and a NOAA um, aircraft for high altitude missions to St. Croix, the U.S. Virgin Islands. So missions are expected to start tomorrow afternoon. And we're going to see the input, the in situ observations, because they're going to be flying into the actual storm itself and getting real time observations. That data will be then put into the computer models and we'll start to benefit from that in more accurate computer model readings as we get into late Thursday night, probably at the earliest, and then, of course, all through the weekend. Because I'd imagine that since they're, they're rebasing there to the Virgin Islands, they're going to be flying almost continuous missions uh, into this storm. So now let's talk about the steering here, okay? Why have models been fluctuating? Because they've been trying to solve if a trough coming in from the north and west is going to drop south enough and be there at the same time that Aaron is due south to break down this ridge that's been driving this storm off towards the west this whole time. They both have to line up perfectly, and that's kind of hard to do. It's going to depend on the forward speed of Aaron and the amplitude of that trough. If it's a weaker trough and it doesn't build as far enough south, it's just not going to meet up, and it's not going to tug Aaron to the north and turn it north and keep it out to sea. So here's how it looks on the European model. This is the pressure pattern by next week, Tuesday, almost a week out from now. Here's Aaron, again, just off to the east-northeast of the Bahamas. We've got the ridge of high pressure, the Bermuda High. But notice the high doesn't break down. The trough at this point is already out in New Finland, okay? So it's already kind of missed it. So the, Aaron's kind of missed the train here. So the escape route would essentially be blocked. So this would suppress Aaron and shunt it a little bit farther to the north and west, closer to the U.S. East Coast, if this happens. How about on the GFS model? Same time frame next Tuesday. We're a little farther east with the initial location of Aaron at this point in time. And the ridge is broken down a little bit more, but notice still that low pressure trough is gone, almost exiting the stage right over here. And the ridge is trying to build itself and fill in the gap. So this could also begin to block the escape route or even push it farther to the west as well. So interesting developments here, and it's really going to depend on the strength and amplitude of that trough coming on in. And if Aaron can meet up with it in time, if they line up, we'll see it turn to the north and zip it out to the north and east out to sea. If not, it would be closer to the coast. Something to certainly monitor there and see how that evolves in the model trends in the coming days. The intensity forecast of Aaron is shown here. 50 mile per hour winds right now, getting up to a hurricane as we get into Friday morning, and then jumping up to a category three at the tail end of the forecast, 120 mile per hour winds by Monday afternoon. Now, the possibility is here, we talked about this yesterday for a period of time of rapid intensification. When you get a storm that's on an intensity trend in that part of the ocean, the Southwest Atlantic, we've seen it many times before that it overachieves. So if that happens, we'd be looking for a period of time of 24 hours that we get a jump in the sustained winds of at least 35 miles per hour within that 24 hour period. It's not all that hard to do if you think about it. 24 hours is a long amount of time in a lifespan uh, of a strengthening hurricane. So it's a possibility right now. It's not explicitly forecast to undergo rapid intensification. 
but it can never be ruled out. So it's just something to keep an eye on as we get into later parts of the weekend and early next week. We've been doing this all week, looking at storm analogs. I kind of shrank down the space a little bit. We were going 150 miles uh, from the general location of Aaron. I'm, I'm going down to 100 miles to kind of limit the storm number. Still, it's an pr impressive amount. 81 storms have passed within 100 miles of Aaron's current location. And of those, only eight, about 10%, have made landfall in the United States since records have been kept. Most do that loop out to sea. Will this happen again? Will it be number nine? Or will it be number 82? Well, it's going to be 82, but will it be number nine that makes landfall? It's too early to tell. It's still very, very far out in the Atlantic Ocean. So the bottom line here, folks, no need to panic or anything like that. Continue to watch the forecast. Stay up to date. Things are going to be changing. You know, the atmosphere is not exact all the time. It, it evolves. Expect more fluctuations over the next 48 hours. Tomorrow, who knows? We could be back here and saying, oh, the trend is back east, which is what we want offshore, right? Recurving out to sea still looks likely, but not certain at this time frame, at least. Now, subtle changes in the forward speed, as we talked about, slows down or speeds up, and the intensity will amplify down the road. Will it meet up with that incoming trough from the north and west out of Canada? Will it not? It's the big question there, and it's something we'll watch, of course, going forward. All right, 98L now. Here it is sitting over land right now. I mean, it's kind of dislocated from the convection here that's sitting over the northern Yucatan. But overall, pretty impressive, pretty robust. Hurricane Center says, eh, probably won't develop. 20% chance there. But as it heads into the southern Bay of Campeche, this area, just because of the geography of it, the shape of the southern Gulf, helps to kind of initiate that spin. And there were some models I was looking at earlier that did show a uh, storm trying to get going. I mean, it's got a pretty long duration of time over some very warm water here in the southern Gulf Bay of Campeche. So it could drift its way towards Mexico and maybe even farther to the north and put Brownsville uh, under the gun for at least some tropical downpours there. Something to be interesting to watch here. Invest 98L over the next couple days. If it does strengthen, Fernand is the next name on the list. It'll be named number six. It's a possibility. All right, folks. Let's get to tropical trivia. Yesterday's question was, which hurricane was the first to have its name retired? Which one do you think it was? Hazel, Carol, Diane, or Audrey? Well, it was Carol back in 1954. This storm, Category 3, into Long Island. How about that? And then the southeastern portions of Connecticut, Rhode Island, and up into New England. Not very unusual to get a hurricane making landfall in that location, but that's what it was, Carol, back in 1954, Category 3. All right, that's the latest for today's uh, Hurricane Hub Live, folks. If you want to find me on social media, if you've got questions, look me up. Facebook, Instagram, I'm on X, and I'm also on TikTok. Reminder, if you have a couple minutes, I'd love for you to download this, the uh, QR code for the 13 News Now Hurricane Guide. It's got information on supplies you should have on hand. Emergency numbers you might need and a whole lot more. And another reminder, we're right back here tomorrow night at 8 p.m. on HHL as we are every weeknight. In fact, we'll probably do special editions this weekend as well. We'll see you back here tomorrow on Thursday at 8 p.m.